Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Modern Squid, where we get to know the people behind our favorite writers and companies. Today's guest is Estrella Alvarez, better known as Star Bobber on Instagram and YouTube. So let's get started and find out where she falls on the scale of full squid to full at gat. Uh, one of the things I plan on asking people, because I call it the modern squid, I'm going to ask people where they fall on that scale of yeah. like, you know, full squid to full at gat. Mm -hmm. So where do you fall on that scale, would you say? Um, I think it depends on the weather. Um, I'm guilty of like riding in like a tank top and jeans when it's hot. Um, I live in Fresno. And so like, for example, it was like 107 this past weekend. Um, so if I do ride, I'm going to be in a tank top and jeans, but for the most part, I try to at least wear a jacket. So I would say I'm like, a squid is what? 10? A squid is it's just like full squid to full at gat, you know, so you can make up yeah. however you would say in between there. Um, yeah, I'm like in the middle. In the middle, okay. Yeah, because even like the jackets I wear aren't like, they don't have any <laughs> armor or anything, so. No armor? I have like two that do, but I rarely wear them. <laughs> Let me ask you this then. Have you ever broken a bone? No. Okay. See, this, I think this is why you're um, more towards the squid level. I've broken my ankle before, and that mm, sucks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not riding a bike, um, just in general. I've never, I've gone over 30 years never breaking a bone. And then I was um, visiting my sister for her wedding, and my brother in law wanted to go rock climbing. So we went out to a rock climbing gym, um, and I just happened to jump off the wall funny and snap my ankle. <laughs> right before the wedding <laughs> so i had to wear sweatpants to my sister's wedding oh my god because <laughs> they put me in a cast and i didn't have anything that fit over it <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> you know i know you mentioned that you live in fresno but did you grow up in fresno or i did yeah so i um was born in san diego and we moved here when i was little so i don't really remember san diego very much so um yeah basically i like to say raised here it's kind of weird when i tell people i was born somewhere else but i feel like i was born here <laughs> yeah no that makes sense i uh, come from military family so we moved every few years or so so for me it's kind of like where i'm from is wherever i spent the most time last you know oh, oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so you know we've heard of you I've, I've seen you talk about you know your husband and your kids but i don't think i've ever heard you mention any siblings do you have any siblings as well or um, yeah, I do. I have two brothers and a sister. Okay. Do you get along mm -hmm. with them or are you guys more of the, the fighting siblings? Um, no, we get along. We get along. Um, I'm the baby. There's like a huge gap between me and the uh, second youngest. There's a nine year age gap. Um, oh. so they're, I think closer, like the three <laughs> of them than me. Um, and so, and then I'm kind of like the rebel of the family. So, but we get along. <laughs> okay. Um, that's, that reminds me. So my ex-wife is also the youngest in her family and there's a giant mm -hmm. age gap as well. Like her mom didn't even know she could still have kids, um, yeah. when my ex-wife was born. So, you know, I, I definitely yeah. understand where you're coming from with that. Yeah. She has the same kind of thing. Like she knows her siblings and someone gets along with them, but it was too much of a gap to really be as close as some other siblings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like we didn't like grow up together, you know, like they were in high school when I was in like elementary school so yeah not as much to talk about when you yeah <laughs> <laughs> do you guys talk more now do you feel like than you did when you were growing up or? um yeah I would say so my brother moved so he's in, not in the state in California but um my sister is and so we talk we talk pretty often all right and we right. have we both have kids that are similar in age so her youngest is um just one year older than my oldest too so that okay. kind of uh, brought us a lot closer so she waited for a while to have kids huh there's an age gap between her <laughs> <laughs> so she has the older two and then she kind of waited and then they had another one. Oh, okay yeah so did your brother move somewhere cool so that you can uh visit somewhere interesting or uh no and actually i haven't visited him yet um but he moved to Kentucky oh, for no. work, so yeah, it's kind of random, but yeah, that's where he's at right now. I'm just kidding for anyone who lives in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you end up going to high school? Um, I went to high school here in Fresno. Um, it's called Roosevelt High School. 
Okay. Um, and it's actually a school of the arts school. I danced. And so that was the main reason why I went there. It wasn't even my district. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I went there. Oh, you stole one of my questions. I was going to ask you what crowd you hung out in, but obviously you were hanging out in the arts crowd. <laughs> yeah, I kind of, yeah, I was like the arts, like, um, Mm, I don't know. I can't explain it. Yeah, I guess it was artsies. It's kind of crazy when you go to a school of the arts school because there's like a lot of different crowds because it's like the arts, but there's like the dancers, the musicians, the actors, the musical people, you know, so there's still like way more crowds than probably a typical high school would have. Okay. So did yeah. you did you gravitate towards one or do you feel like you were one of those people that kind of cross pollinated between all the different groups or I would say I crossed and then like I'm one of those people where I have like two really really close friends versus like somebody who has a bunch of like friends mm -hmm. you know so um that's kind of how I was I kind of had like my two or three main like people that I hung out with um in fact one of them is still a really best friend now so oh nice mm hmm so what kind of dance did you specialize in or was it not really a specialty at that point? Yeah, no, I did um, folklorical, which is like Mexican um, dancing in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it's Mexican dance. It's always hard for me to explain what it is um, when you don't know it, but it's kind of like, if you're, not, if you're not familiar with it, if there's like a mariachi band playing, mm -hmm. um, envision the girls dancing, that's kind of what, <laughs> that's so, what it is. <laughs> now, would it be the type of dancing you were doing in that dress recently on your Instagram post? Yes, yes. All right, so for yes. everyone listening, if you want to see what she's talking <laughs> about, go to her Instagram. Yeah. You'll see both photos and video of her uh, doing that. It was really cool. My girlfriend saw that and she was jealous. She loved your dress. Oh, she said yeah, she's always wanted one, but she hasn't hasn't gone and gotten one, so. <laughs> Okay. So, um, did you get involved in any other, any other activities in school besides dancing or were you pretty focused on, on dance? Um, no, just dancing. I was one of those people who hated high school. So I just, you know, if it wasn't for dancing, I'm not too sure if I would have even gone, been able to get through it. <laughs> so whose decision was it to go to the, um, the dance high school or the arts high school? Um, it was mine because I danced, um, ever since I was little. So it was one of those things where like, I'd always done it and the school specialized in it. Um, and my, one of my older brothers had went there as well. So, um, I kind of followed in his footsteps. He wasn't a dancer. He did more like arts, like the acting and everything and the uh, stage building. So I kind of was familiar with the school because of him. Okay. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Is, you think that that's um, one of the benefits of living in California that you have access to those types of schools or do you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I definitely we have schools like that. We have a middle school like that. We have like a school like elementary. I think it's like kindred through eighth. That's a art school. So, yeah. Okay. Do you think you're going to put any of your kids in um, in art school or you going to wait and see what their interests are in? It depends what they're interested in. My, one of mine plays piano. So if he like sticks to it and wants to do that, um, he has like a real like appreciation for music. So there might be a chance that he will go there. Um, maybe my daughter. I don't know. She's kind of, <laughs> she changes her personality all the time. I mean, so she's we'll young, see. right? They're both <laughs> nine. So they're twins. Wow. That's got to be. A yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My oldest too. Yeah. All right. Ah, your husband. When did you meet your husband? Um, I met my husband on, I met him New Year's Eve. It was, uh, like 2009 turning to 2010. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I met him at a New Year's Eve party. <laughs> okay. So then, yeah. um, was he, Obviously, okay, so 2009, it's already 2020. I'm going to assume, was that high school? No, I was 19. So I think I had just been maybe a year and a half out of high school or something, something like that. Okay, so he wasn't so, someone from your, your high school that you knew. Um, no, it was a co-worker's cousin. It was a co-worker's, like a friend um, that I worked with, and another co-worker was having a New Year's Eve party. And she invited him to the party. So he was there. Oh, wow. Okay. That's yeah. cool. So uh, does your husband dance? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Do you think, uh, is he not interested in dancing or do you just uh, have high uh -huh. expectations and so you don't want him to dance? <laughs> 
I mean, <laughs> definitely not like the dancing that I do, but like he'll dance like at a wedding or a an event, then yeah, I'll like he'll dance, but yeah, not like what I do. I don't he's not no, he he played soccer all his life, so he's like kind of more like athletic type. Okay. So yeah. Wow. I I wasn't really an athlete in high school, but I am I guess would be considered one now just because I, I am a long distance runner. You are? <laughs> So I I ran like half in full marathons. So. so I uh funny story. This is the reason I hate running, by the way. So um I did different types of, like martial arts and stuff when I was a kid. Okay, yeah. And my dad told me, um, you know, you gotta do one high school sport before you get out of high school, just so you've got something to put on college applications and that sort of a thing. Mm-hmm. But because I hadn't been playing any sports um during my my school career. I mm-hmm. didn't have any of the, the basic skills for things like baseball, basketball, you know, football, that sort of a thing. Yeah. And um, we'd moved into a school where it was in the Midwest and everyone had been playing the same sport under the same coaches since like middle school. <sighs> right. Yeah. And so um, when I was looking to figure out what exactly I was going to do, I was talking to my neighbor and he was like, oh, cross country doesn't have any tryouts. And I said, well, what's cross country? And he said, oh, you just run. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah. He's like, it's super easy. I've been doing it forever. And, uh, you know, and I, I didn't have a lot of money. And so I was like, well, what do you have to buy to, to do cross country? And he's like, all you need is a pair of shorts, a t-shirt and shoes. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, this is my kind of sport. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I showed up the first day. I was like, no tryouts and it's dirt cheap. Perfect. I show up the first day. And the coach is talking to everyone and, you know, they're shooting the breeze with them. Everyone knows everyone, you know, they've mm-hmm. been running together for years. And uh, so he goes, all right, guys, so run over to the uh, field, blah, 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 the same route as usual. And we'll, we'll meet and stretch out. And uh, I was like, I don't know where, how to get there. You know, I've never done this before. And they're like, oh, just follow us. It's no problem. Two miles later. So keep in mind, I've never run a mile in my life. Two miles <laughs> later. <laughs> we get to this spot and everyone's stretching out and I'm dying. I'm already done. You know, I've, I've never run a mile before and I just had to do yeah. a two mile warm up. I'm done. I'm cooked. Um, so the coach is all mad and he's like, hurry up and stretch and then meet us over at the, uh, the track. So I hurry up, I stretch real quick. I run over the track and he's explaining what the next exercise is going to be. And he's talking about mile repeats and you know, I'm like, Hey coach, what's a mile repeat? And he looks at me like I've got a third eyeball and he goes, you run a mile and then you repeat it. And I was like, what? You run a mile and then you repeat it. And I was like, well, how many times? He's like, as many as you can. <laughs> so we were just running and running and running. And he was telling me the goal was that each mile that you ran was supposed to be faster than the last one. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, it was just, anyway, that went on for an entire season. By the end of the season, I never wanted to look at another pair of running shoes again. <laughs> I was always the slowest in all the races yeah. because I'd never done it before. Um, but, you know, it was a learning experience. Yeah. All right. So when you guys met, who asked who out first? Did he ask you out? Did you ask him out? Or was it more kind of the, the modern thing where you guys just started kind of hanging out and then? Yeah. Um, we started hanging out like as friends for like maybe like a month. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was New Year's Eve. Um, so we were like, I guess I met him. We were kind of hung out here and there. And he asked me out for Valentine's Day. Oh, okay. Yeah. And th- now, did you find that sweet or did you find it cheesy or? <laughs> no, it was sweet. I just, I think at first I didn't know, like, I just, he was like a friend. So, um, but <laughs> I think it was like af- a week after the whole Valentine's Day, we were like officially like boyfriend and girlfriend. So oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So how long did you guys date before you ended up pulling the trigger and getting married? So we actually got pregnant before we got married. <laughs> so, um, um, so we got pregnant with my, with the twins. And then, um, when the twins were, I think like eight months, we got pregnant with our last son. And so we didn't get married until 2014. Okay, so yeah. like five, six years or so since you yeah, met him? Yeah, I think it's going to be six years this year. All right, so you guys definitely knew each other. It wasn't one of those things where it was like a week later, you're getting married and your family's going, what are you doing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Were you a kid person before you started having kids? No. <laughs> okay. Did you imagine yourself having um, kids or were you kind of on the fence? Not really. I mean, not that I didn't imagine myself having kids. I think I, I think I knew maybe eventually one day I would have children. I just didn't um, expect it to happen so soon um, because I'm a young mom. I was, I had two kids by my 21st birthday. Um, so I think that's what it is. I, before them though, like the only kids I were, I was ever around were my nephews and I loved my nephews, but like any other children, I, you know, I wasn't one of those girls who was like, Oh, how cute your baby. So cute. Like I could care less if that was your baby. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't. So it's yeah, crazy. Yeah. Well, that's neat. I mean, yeah. I, uh, you know, I'm not really a big of a kid person, but, um, my sister just had a baby not too long ago and I love being an uncle because yes. my niece is adorable. Yeah. Uh, she's fun to hang out with. And then when she starts throwing a tantrum, I'm just like, okay, mom, you need to yeah. uh, come and get Paisley. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I feel like it's kind of the best of both worlds for me personally, mm-hmm. because uh, I get all the benefits of having an adorable child, but none of the responsibilities. Yep. <laughs> but I do admire people who like to have kids because obviously, you know, the world needs people, I suppose. Depending on yeah. who you ask. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to some motorcycle questions. So I think I saw in one of your videos that you said that you started thinking about riding a motorcycle based on parking. Yes. Is that true? School. True? Or do you, do you think you yeah. had any like... I mean, I never really thought of it before. Um, like when I met my husband, he rode and... Um, like I never really thought anything of it. I, it didn't really cross my mind for me to ever ride. Um, but yeah, I, the main reason was because I was going to community college and the parking is horrible there. Um, and I was always, you know, driving around trying to find parking and these bikes were just like zoom right in and just park and like go to class and it would drive me crazy. So I was like, I want to, that's like one of the big pushers for me was like, I just, when I first envisioned me riding, I was like, I'm only going to ride to school. Like that's all it's really going to be for and whatever. Um, I didn't think I would like fall in love with it so much. (laughs) So let me ask you this. So if, if your idea was to ride to school, what made you go with, um, a brand new Indian? So the, okay. (laughs) I've always wanted and not always, but I always liked Indians. Like (laughs) <laughs> this is so crazy so when I was pregnant with my first two uh twins I was put on bed rest and so all I did was watch tv and I was obsessed with the show American Pickers I don't know if you've ever watched it I've seen it I have yeah yeah okay that's funny I was literally watching it before I came on here with you <laughs> it's on <laughs> right now it's like a marathon all day um but I loved that show and uh that's where I learned about the brand Indian was through um through Mike which is one of the guys on the show Mm -hmm. and he loved the brand he would always just praise it and I would learn little history about it like you know with every episode so then in my mind that always kind of stuck out like Indian motorcycle kind of always stuck out and I kind of associated it with like old and vintage and I love that kind of stuff like I eat that shit up so that's kind of where it started was like I wanted like an Indian you know yeah um same thing with the bobber like the whole like bobber thing kind of same thing 1940s and I love the 40s and stripping everything down because they needed it for something you know all of that um so when the bobber my husband sent me a picture of the bobber um I believe it was before it was even released and um it was before it was released actually and I was like oh my god that bike is like beautiful. I mean, there's not men like I said before he rode he rode a sports bike and it didn't like catch my I never like t- bikes didn't turn my head um yeah. but that one did and so it was just you know when you know <laughs> so I mean I'm a fan of basically all motorcycles but I will say to me most sport bikes kind of look like bugs um to varying degrees so aesthetically I, I'm not that interested in the sport bikes and i'm not a speed demon you know so the performance i'm the same but what does get me is i do like the stunt riding people do on them um oh i see you know like i like seeing people popping wheelies and doing burnouts yeah (laughs) that kind of stuff interests me but i'm too new of a rider to really even think about that sort of a thing right now um 
but um the indians were beautiful i was i mean i just bought my first bike in april and um it was down to an indian scout um mm-hmm. or the uh, iron 883 from harley and mm-hmm. i ended up going with the harley mostly because i've always liked harleys mm-hmm. um and kind of thought i mean I never really thought about riding a motorcycle until I went to Nicaragua and uh, got on one. Mm. My friend was showing me how to ride. Um, I always thought it was too dangerous for the amount of fun that you'd have with it. Mm, yeah. But then you sit on the bike and you're like, this is way more fun than I thought it was going to be. God <laughs> yeah. damn it. I'm hooked. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, kind of get back though to your Indian uh, adventure. I'm just, you know, Personally, I do accounting as my day job. And so when I'm thinking, you know, I want to get like access to close parking. I want it to be cheap. I don't think let's go with a brand new, you know, moderately (laughs) priced bike, you know. So what you ever consider is going with something like used and and reliable, like a Honda Rebel or something? Or did you always go, I want something beautiful? I didn't even know what a Honda Rebel was until I took my CHP course. So... uh, but no, I think so. When I think used, I think like old, like I would get like a super like vintage looking one. And I think my husband was kind of like, it needs to be reliable. It needs to be, um, you know, and it, it helps that my husband was like willing to like spend the money on it, you know? Um, so I was kind of like, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I definitely didn't really ever look at used ones. And if, used ones ever came up it was more of like because my husband's looking at different bikes you know maybe he wants a different bike or whatever it might be yeah yeah okay well that's cool i mean i kind of went down the same route i originally was considering getting sort of an older used bike because i figured i'd beat it up i've never ridden a bike before you know i just passed my msf course and i was like if i get something nice i'm just gonna ding it up you know, maybe I'll go with something cheap. And then I started looking at the the prices of the cheap things versus just getting something new and negotiating the price hard. And um, I just know my luck with used cars. And I was like, if my mm. luck with used bikes is anything like used cars, I should just go with something new. So yeah. I, I switched my mind and just went with something new because I don't know anything mechanically. Like I can't do anything besides change oil in a car, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I get it. I kind of same. <laughs> so I'm with your husband. I went the uh, reliable route too, you know? Yeah. Just have it be reliable and hopefully there's no issues, there major issues. Um, how long did it take you to make your decision on what bike to get? Um, Not long, really, because I think ever since that text message from him with the picture of the bike, it was like, Love there was just no other bike that was going to come. Yeah. The only other one that I considered was the Triumph um, Bobber. Mm -hmm. and I think I even saw that one at my dealership um but there's something about and I like triumphs like if I were to get another bike because I have two Indians if I were to get a third bike possibly I don't know because I think I feel like I would get a bagger and I probably wouldn't get a triumph and a bagger so if I were to get like a fourth bike I would get a triumph I wouldn't mind having a triumph in my garage basically I like triumphs I just like I said I just after even now like something I I see other bikes. I just, there's not a bike that can beat the bobber. But um, you mentioned bagger. That's quite a difference from a bobber though. That's basically the opposite of a bobber. It really is. I think it's just because, um, because my bobber is so bobbed out, like it's really uncomfortable. (laughs) Like I ride it around town. Like I rode it to school, Um, you know, whatever here and there. I, I really can't go very long on it without like, just wanting to it's just really uncomfortable um but there's situations that come up where like I want to travel but I want to ride and even with the FTR the FTR is really not that comfortable either um it's still more comfortable than the bobber but it's still not I I I want like a big cruiser I think (laughs) I mean not like tomorrow you know maybe when my kids get older and I can travel (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, I'm only curious because, again, usually, like, if you're drawn to the bobber style, the, mm-hmm. the baggers aren't as appealing, you know? Yeah. Um, so They're, when, when they're mentioned, not, but I would probably make it look nice. Oh, I've seen some beautiful looking <laughs> bo- um, beautiful yeah. looking baggers. I'm not a bagger fan myself either. I'm more mm-hmm. of a stripped down. Like, I love, like, the more stripped down it is, the more I like it. The less fairings it has, the better it looks to me. 
You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, oh yeah. I, I went to um, a bike week, Cave, Cave Creek bike week out here in Arizona. Uh, before I rode, I was just helping out with a charity. We were, we were doing some fundraising um, at the event and I saw this guy ride by with his bike and it was the first time I'd seen a bobber. I was like, oh, <laughs> God, what is that thing? What is that? Yeah. You know what I mean? So I went up and talked to him about it. He's like, oh, this is a bobber. And he was like showing me all the stuff that he like pulled off it to make it look yeah. like that. And mm-hmm. I was just like, if I ever get a bike, I want something like that. <laughs> <You Yeah. know? laughs> anyway, so the bagger thing, like I, I get it. I keep hearing everyone talk about how comfortable they are. Um, yeah but aesthetically i feel like there's really two different types of people you either like sort of a bobber style or you like that bagger style and you got the people in the middle but then they usually buy kind of a standard like a soft tail or you know what i mean something like that and yeah. then move up like a rib king. Yeah. yeah yeah so okay well, that's cool um let's see you did mention that your husband rides what is he currently riding so he doesn't really okay so he rides but he doesn't ride like i don't know if that makes sense i think it's just kind of more of like the timing like in our lives right now i guess so he works full-time and because i'm a stay-at-home mom and full-time student um you he's kind of constantly working and so his job too requires him to drive a big truck so it's not like he can ride the bike um to work or anything like that so he doesn't like he rides maybe like once a week if he if he if if that and so and he'll just ride either of the indians to be honest so it's just kind of like oh so he doesn't have his own specific bike right now i mean i wouldn't uh, kind i mean there what's mine is his (laughs) (laughs) but like it's it's cool though because like we're similar but at the same time we're i mean when it comes to the bikes like we kind of have similar tastes um, but then again, like, and I'm speaking in terms of like modifications on the bikes, usually we have similar, but there's also times where like, I'm like, no, like, I'm sorry, I'm not listening to you. And I want to do this to the bike. So, um, but then he, it, it, it grows on him. <laughs> so there's no like major issues. Yeah. He's just kind of like, just chill. He's like the most chill person. So, really. so what happened to his, um, crotch rocket then? Uh, he sold it. Okay. Did he sell yeah, it to buy one of the bikes ago. or was that? I'm sorry? Did he sell it to buy one of the current bikes or was that, I guess you just said no, it was a long time no, ago. No, 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 that, He sold it just because um, life, you know, I was pregnant and we needed to get a house. I, I didn't have a reliable car, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And he had like a truck too, like a Lord, like fixed up truck when I met him, like, you know, bagged and everything. And he sold that too. <laughs> well yeah. you know twins can be unexpected and expensive you know, so. yeah so why the ftr is your second bike what what drew you to that bike so i think the main thing that drew me to that bike was that it was different from the bobber and that i would learn how to ride different style bikes like mm-hmm. i feel like and not that like my bike is small or anything i feel like my bike is kind of easy to learn to ride on and I didn't feel confident enough if I were to go and like test ride another bike or um like especially a higher bike because the FTR is definitely a lot higher um and also I just wanted to be I just want to be an all-around good rider I want to be able to jump on any bike and ride it and be confident and the FTR is intimidating as fuck (laughs) so um and not only that it's just a nice it's a nice bike. I'm not attracted to those types of bikes, to be honest, like any kind of like sport looking dirt bike. Like, I'm just not, um, but that one's different and right. Okay. Let me correct myself. So stock it's like, eh. um, I saw a picture of a, um, Jimmy burnout. I'm not sure if you know who he is, but Mm-mm. he has that bike and he has like certain modifications to it like an exhaust and everything that's the bike that i saw that i was like oh my god i want that bike and not the ftr that is stocked in the dealership which right now my ftr is still stock (laughs) so it drives me crazy like looks wise it's not i wasn't like drawn completely because of looks to it um but i have a really clear vision of what i want to do to it to make it look more like me yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, if if um, you compare it to the bobber, I mean, aesthetically, it's, I would say, not as pretty. 
You know what I mean? Oh, it's definitely more no. u- kind of utilitarian, you know, like looks like it's got a purpose more, more than like the, the bobbers, which look like they look cool, sound cool. You know, it's like, I get more, cause I obviously ride both of them. I get more like head turns on the bobber than I do on the FTR. Um, like, and just be parking it, people will come up to me and talk to me about the bobber. Whereas the FTR people will just like kind of look at it and like, whatever, it's just another bike. Like, the bobber has this ability to draw people's attention and the the person doesn't even necessarily have to be into motorcycles. They just look at it and be like, that's a nice bike. Um, and then it's kind of like that cherry on top when, especially when it's like older people, I've noticed when they find out it's an Indian, they're just kind of like, Oh my God, like that's an Indian. And like, what year is it? They start talking to me about the bike. Um, I, sometimes I feel like when I tell people the FTR is an Indian, they don't believe me. Like that's not an Indian because it's so different looking. Like Indians it never is. made anything like it. So but I'm like, yeah, no, it's an Indian. Like I, I promise. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because um, I was seeing a lot of really good reviews. Like people who ride it seem to really like it. Yeah. Um, th- but for me, it was it was a little bit out of left field because you look at what Indians been making. And mm-hmm. they seem to focus really heavily on making beautiful bikes because they are, you know, yeah. Indian makes these beautiful bikes. And then yes. the FTR came out and I was looking at it and I was like, I, I, do they use a different design team? Because like, uh, <laughs> they, they, they have such great taste in like 99% of their bikes. And then I'm not saying the FTR is ugly. The FTR is definitely not ugly. It's just that when you set the bar as high as they have with their styling, and then you come out with something that looks good, then you go, you know, hey, like, but then you start to hear again. So you you see the people riding it and how much fun they're having. And then you kind of, get yeah. the, you know, like they, they put the time into the performance aspect, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. To making Absolutely. It, yeah, yeah. And, and then that's, that's when it kind of clicked to me. I was like, okay, so they're trying to shift focus, get a whole new market of people who are more yes. interested in performance. Yes. Um, and still, and it has some of that Indian style. It just didn't go like full Indian style in my mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I absolutely agree. Yeah. But you can still make it look good. I have, I promise, like, mon- months from now, it's going to look a lot nicer. <laughs> yeah, like you, I've seen a few of them online that um, yeah. definitely look like people put some work into them and they look better. Mm-hmm. But I, I do agree with you. Stock, they're a little bit, it's almost, they're not plain, you know. It's the exhaust. Is that what it is, I you think? think? I think it's the exhaust. Like, I don't really, I'm not a fan of it. It's just so huge and bulky and. Yeah. I think for me, I think it might be the fork color or something, but. I uh... hate the forks too. Um, (laughs) I don't like the gold. I think it looks real um, tacky. So yeah, I mean, I think like, uh, I don't know. It's kind of hard. I don't think that anybody can purchase. Maybe everyone's different can purchase a bike off the lot all stock and like be like it's perfect for me i think we all have different taste and um that's something i love about you know motorcycles and is, is modifying it to be yours um so i'm yeah i i have stuff planned um for the ftr my exhaust should be ready by the end of this week um and so yeah yeah i um I don't think I would go as far as you with the, with the forks, you know, um, but there was just like, I felt like that with, maybe you're right. Maybe it is the exhaust. It was like a com- combination of these like little things where I was just like, this bike has got a lot of potential, but the, yeah. it just, for me, aesthetically it, it missed. But then again, I'm like watching all these reviews of people loving riding it. And then I found myself like, man, if this stupid uh, state ever opens up again, I'd love to go test ride one. <laughs> everyone that test rides it loves it falls you know the funny thing is is that i hadn't even sat on the bike until i went to go purchase it like when we went to go and buy it that was my first time sitting on it and mostly because i knew in my head i was going to psych myself out because it was going to be really tall and i was going to be tiptoeing it and i was going to be like no no i can't do it like i'm not good enough or i'm not a good enough rider i'm not experienced enough um but then again i started on the scout bobber which is a pretty big bike for me um power wise and so um my husband was like no you're fine you can do it like he's like that like real like you got this and so yeah that was my first time even sitting on it um and then like I, of course I think I wrote it the next day I was afraid to go write it that when we brought it home and I was going like super slow 
<laughs> on the streets. I was like, ah. Oh, I mean, I had mine delivered to my house, so I can't, uh, I can't say much. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I did the MSF course, but you know, it's all in the parking lot. And my previous yeah. experience um, riding was in Nicaragua in um, like a grass field. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'd never been on the street with cars before. Yeah. And, you know, with the whole situation that's going on right now, I didn't want to be out mm-hmm. and about anyway. Um, and plus, most things were closed. Um, so yeah. I called Harley on the whims like, hey, are you guys still selling bikes? <laughs> <laughs> and luckily they were and they, they were able to deliver it. And um, it's been it's been a lot of fun. I've been doing a lot of like parking lot practice stuff. Um, I don't, okay, have, you, yeah. have you ever heard of Moto Jitsu? No. Nope. Oh my gosh. You Motor Jitsu. Mo- Moto Jitsu. I actually, I have his hat outside right now drying because I washed it. Um, it just came in today and it's been the hat that this hat sucks. Uh, but it's the only one I've got and I've got the COVID hair. So it's like all like long and poofy. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> So I need a hat and I ordered this um, hat from Moto Jitsu a long time ago. It's through Teespring on YouTube, you know, so I thought it was going to be fast. Oh, yeah, but yeah. I guess they're getting hit hard with the whole, you know, shutdown. So it took like forever to get the hat. Anyway, it's outside. Moto yeah. Jitsu, that's beside the point. He is a YouTuber and he's actually based uh, somewhere in California. He does the courses. Like he's a teacher for a oh. bunch of the courses and he's got a YouTube channel and he also has books out. So I bought his book, um, the Moto yeah. Jitsu it Drills. Familiar. Yeah, yeah he, his, he goes by Fast Eddie is his nickname and he basically just gives you all these different tips and tricks on how to like get better riding your motorcycle. And oh, okay. so his book actually has all the drills with the measurements and everything. So I bought some cones. I bought one of those little sticks that you can like measure distance from. Yeah. There's a parking lot near me. I just go set them up and I, and I do the drills, you know, um, I use the measured drills probably once a week. And then I basically try to do some emergency stopping and swerving basically every time I ride the bike, either you're, you know, before I leave to go for my ride or when I'm yeah. almost home, I'll stop by in a parking lot near my house just because, you know, I saw people in my MSF class that have been riding motorcycles on the street for years and they were uh-huh. having so much trouble with like the basics because riding on the street is a little bit different than really being able to um, like do these low speed maneuvers and, and even emergency stopping, which could save your life. These people couldn't do it properly, you know? Um, that's so yeah yeah. they they offer a like a second like intermediate course i know like the chp one here in california does and i want to take that uh especially with the ftr because the bobber i'm pretty confident on and um and i can stop pretty well but i know i was actually just talking to my husband about it like just two days ago maybe that I still fear like st- like I downshift too fast on the FTR because I'm afraid I'm not going to stop in time by the time I get to the light um and it just kind of yeah I would definitely I mean there's no there's no shame in taking those courses you know especially like the intermediate ones and it, you know I know I've been riding for almost two years but um it's it's a new style bike for me so well I think um you know one of the things that they talk or he talks about on his channel is that you know you can upgrade your bike and that's kind of upgrading hardware, but it's actually more important to upgrade the software, you know, which is your body and your mind's reaction. Um, and, you know, yeah, you'll, you'll be surprised. I mean, emergency braking, especially that's one thing I've been focused on a lot um, because the perception that you have of how far you actually need to stop, I mean, they probably do the same thing out here. That's called an MSF course in California. It sounds like it's called something different, but, um, yes. did they, did they do that demonstration in your guys's class where they made you like guess how long it was going to take them to stop by putting a cone out and then actually hitting no, the brakes? Not a guess, but we had to stop. So we had to get up to, I think third gear maybe. And then we had to downshift and stop and we couldn't like pass a certain distance. Like we had to stop within that distance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was one of those people. I did horrible on my CHP course. I didn't think they were going to pass me. Well, I think that, um, (laughs) you know, at least in our class, they were talking about how most people have like a certain range you fall in and like every single class, you know, there's, everyone's kind of in the middle. Some people might be a little bit better. Some might people might be a little bit worse, but pretty much everyone's in the middle. um, Most classes. And um, I think, you know, as long as you pass and if you keep practicing, especially so keep practicing, um, (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I mean, that was a long time ago. I'm definitely a lot better writer now, but um, I don't do well under pressure and I don't do well with like all eyes on me. And it, that's kind of how it felt because yeah. we had, you know, you go one by one and um, it's funny because I was stalling like crazy and I just couldn't. Yeah, it was just it was all in my head. It was more of like a mental thing for me. So, oh, I completely understand. I mean, mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm not much of a public speaker either. And so yeah. when I'm doing like um, YouTube lives or something like that, and if I get to, well, mostly Instagram, because um, I've got a photography business on the side. And so my, my photography oh, okay. account's got like, it's not that big, it's a couple thousand or something. But um, either way, sometimes when I go live on there, I'll get a couple hundred people and then it feels like I'm on the spot and I'm just like, oh, blah, blah, I can't talk, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I I totally get it. So okay. I noticed that um, a lot of women right now are starting to ride more than in the past, but it still seems like they're lagging behind the men. Obviously, as far as numbers are concerned, what do you think brands could do, if anything, to get more women interested in riding motorcycles? What brands can do? Um, I think the one thing that is kind of important is maybe advertising to women. Um, and that could be either like commercials or Instagram, social media. Um, I don't know, make us feel like we're welcome in the community because I think it's obviously very uh, male dominant, but I also think that they cater to the men more than they do to the women. Like, I mean, I think that there has been some change, but still, I don't know. I think it's the, for us women, we're not stupid. <laughs> and like the whole advertising thing can be kind of like either hit or miss. Um, and I'm one of those people that like, if I see so like an advertisement, whether it be like a poster, a commercial, whatever, and it's like a freaking like model sitting on a bike who obviously doesn't know how to ride then I'm not going to be sold if I see somebody that I can relate to then I can see myself and be like oh like if I can do that you know um so I think that they don't do a very good job at that and I think I think it's like most no I'm not going to call out brands but I think it's most of them <laughs> I mean, I think that it's fair to say if you look at most of the advertisements um, for the different motorcycles, you're either going to have primarily men in the ads um, or depending on the brand, you might have like the hot girl on a bike, like you said, who doesn't really ride. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and my, my thing is like, personally, I'm not against a hot girl on a bike as long as... Um, it's a hot girl who actually rides a bike, you know, I mean, cause if you look on Instagram now, there's plenty of women who are both models and, um, you know, bikers, like they truly love motorcycles. So I feel mm -hmm. like if a brand wants to go that route, at least they could pick someone from the community instead of just like some random, <laughs> random model, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I just feel like why pay somebody who really isn't even that interested when you can pay someone who, I don't know. I mean, they possibly bought your bike. So like, you know what I mean? It's like, you're even. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, not only that, but, um, I think that people can, you know, they can smell bullshit to some degree. Right. Oh, and, yeah. you know, I think that when I was going through some of my marketing classes, um, years ago, they were talking about how people value authenticity. And I think that, you know, like you were saying, being able to see more people who you can relate to on a motorcycle would have, you know, probably helped other women too, you know, yeah. buy bikes. And I think that comes down to authenticity. And, you know, if you're just going with someone who's just a model, but not really interested in motorcycles and on two different fronts now, they've disconnected from their audience. You know, yeah. not everyone's a model, number one. Absolutely. And then number two, you, if you can tell the person doesn't know what they're doing on a bike, then mm -hmm. it doesn't seem authentic either. So yeah, now, yeah it's, yeah, I it's, agree with it, you. It, it, it really doesn't. I don't, yeah, I don't know. Um, I know like, 
I'm not sure if you know this, but that I was in an Indian motorcycle magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the, um, it was their riders group magazine and they asked six of us real riders to be a part of it. And so I thought that was really cool. And for one, I was excited cause like I got to be a part of it, but I think I was more excited at the fact that it was like real riders, like real owners who purchase their bikes and love their bikes and rep their bikes. And they're asking us to, um, to kind of rep- represent their, their brand. And so that was really cool. That was like a really, I don't know if they're going to continue to go into that direction. I know that this was the first time they've done it. So, um, and if you look at the other riders, um, that were in it, not just me, we're very diverse. And so that was cool to see too. You don't see very many, um, like especially Latin women being represented in the motorcycle community. So, um, especially even with my brand Indian, you know, I think, Harley does a decent job at um, being more inclusive, but I don't think Indian has really done so great. Well, so what I would say um, is Indian is, you know, it's owned by Polaris, right? I mean, you obviously know that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And Polaris, I mean, they are great business people, but I don't know, have you ever looked at their board of directors or their C-suite? Uh, no. If you if you go to their website and you you look at the people who are in uh, the upper the senior management and on their board of directors, it's just to uh-huh. see a sea of white people. Oh, I see. That's all it is. <laughs> it makes so they, they basically got no diversity in their upper management. So it's not shocking to me that it's taking them a little bit longer, maybe. Um, you know, to realize it, jump on the uh, idea that, Oh, maybe our advertisement should be a little more diverse. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, but I mean, I think that they'll get it to be honest. I think that, um, I think with time and times are changing. So I think that they'll start to pick up on it and, I mean, more and more women are writing, like it's a whole market that they're going to miss out on if they don't jump on it. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I think it was, uh, Oh, I don't want to miss, I don't want to misquote this woman's Instagram handle. I think she's like lady writer or something on Instagram, but, Mm -hmm. uh, she just did a video where, um, she was talking about how women, um, female writers are the fastest growing group of new motorcycle writers in the market. You yeah, know, so, I've heard that too. Yeah, so any company that's not at least considering what they can do to get some more of that market share is crazy. And let's say, yeah. you know, I heard some criticism that, you know, that they're using polling versus um, insurance numbers, you know, because mm-hmm. obviously if you get insurance data, then you know who's insuring the bikes. It's a little bit more accurate yeah. than just sending out a poll. Hey, do you ride or not? Are you a woman or a man? Yeah. <laughs> you know? But even if you just consider the fact that, you know, most riders are men, then you know that the most potential to gain new riders has got to be in the group that's not riding. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. So, it makes sense. But, you know. Yeah. People will get on board eventually. Yeah, they will. Hopefully. All right. So let's get into the Indian ambassador stuff. Um how long after writing did, did it take before Indian contacted you about maybe being an Indian ambassador? Yeah. Well, so like, I mean, I guess I wouldn't consider myself like an ambassador, but I guess I can see how people would. Um, okay. So, so the first uh, time they, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so you're not an official ambassador because I know Harley's got ambassadors. I don't know what Indian calls them. I assumed that you were related to them in some way because they had you in the magazine. And, you know, I think that they've sent you like shirts and, and gear or something before. So um, what, what do they kind of think of you? I don't know what I, I honestly feel like I'm just a writer, like I'm a writer and they happen to stumble across, um, my Instagram and asked to be part of the shoe. Um, I don't necessarily like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to like explain our relationship, I guess you could say. (laughs) I think that it's kind of like um, one of those, I don't know. Sounds very 2020 relationship, you know? Right? (laughs) (laughs) 
<gasps> like there's no official title. Like, we haven't really. <laughs> we're, we're talking. You're talking. <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, I have a good relationship with them, and so I don't. Um, but at the same time, like I, I think they're like that with a lot of um, like platforms. Like I know that they gave a guy on YouTube a bike for 30 days to ride and test ride, and so I think a lot of brands are starting to. Um, realize the power of social media and influencers and YouTubers. And so they're kind of like testing it out. And um, so we'll see where it leads us. You know, I don't know what it'll do, so, what I mean, it'll lead me. That makes perfect sense though, because a lot of people are doing what they call cord cutting, right? So fewer and fewer people have cable TV now and everyone's kind of moving to YouTube. Um, I mean, I can tell you, I don't even own a TV. So oh, well. <laughs> I get all of my, I don't watch a lot of TV, but when I do, it's like Netflix. Um, what's the other one? I think I've got stars. Um, I think because I've got Amazon prime, I've got Amazon prime video, but I really, I mean, I probably watch an hour or two of um, quote unquote TV, a yeah. month, but I watch a lot of YouTube you know, got you. And so if advertisers are smart, they're going to start doing what these guys are doing, which is, you know, Hey, try this bike, show your audience. Um, yeah. I'm on Instagram a lot. Like I, you know, I saw a lot of the, um, content you were producing, which really introduced me more deeply into Indian because, mm -hmm. um, and actually one of the reasons I started considering Indian as one of the bikes was because I saw so many of your pictures of those, um, the Indian scouts. And I was just like, Oh my God, that is a beautiful bike. So I've gotten yeah. messages from people saying that they bought the bike because of me, um, because of my page and, um, even and not just the bike itself, but like modifications that I've done to the bike, I'll get, you know, what did you do to this? What did you use? Like, you know, and so, um, but it's crazy to think that. And I think Indian as a business is realizing that, that how much of a, like, influence influencers have um because i've lost count of how many people have told me that they've gotten the bobber because of my page yeah i was legitimately set on the iron 883 and then mm -hmm. i kept i kept seeing your posts and i kept looking at yeah. that, that bobber going oh my god that thing is so pretty it is and <laughs> um, so i seriously i seriously started considering it to the point where i was sending screenshots of both bikes to my friends and family going which one do you Which like one? better? You know, and it was pretty much split 50 50. So they didn't help me at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, That's so funny. But, but yeah. So, I mean, social media works. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Um, all right. So, kind of along the same lines as far as, you know, this ambiguous relationship with uh, Indian that you have, what are some of the things that Indian has done for you as a creator? Um, so they've given me, so for one, I got to do the magazine. Um, I've been featured on their page. Um, I've been asked to do a, like a voiceover thing for their page as well. Um, just talking about like why I chose, uh, Indian. Um, and so, yeah, like basically just that I know, like I'll probably team up with them when I do a giveaway, um, uh, probably when I hit like 20 K in my mind is what I'm thinking is when I'll do it. Um, so yeah, so things like that. I mean, I got a lot of like, um, gear, I guess, and swag from them when I did the magazine shoot. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool. But, um, other than that, you know, that's it. Okay. Um, so, you know, I mean, I'm sure I already know the answer to this, but, um, you talk a lot on your social media about how much you enjoy pinup. How well do you feel that the bobber has been fitting into that whole pinup aesthetic that you have going? Yeah, I think it fits in like perfectly. <laughs> Did you have um, a different bike in mind when you first were considering the pinup look or, you know? No. Okay. No, like it's so crazy. Like, I mean, I guess it's not necessarily like one particular, like anything old. So if it was like a 1940s bike, um, then I would love it. But again, like I didn't ever see myself purchasing one, even if I do purchase one in the future, it's kind of one of more of those like trophy pieces where I would ride it here and there, show it off, take it to shows or whatnot. Um, 
but the bobber just kind of fit that like modern vintage feel that I was going for and um I don't like to give myself like a title title but like I would consider myself to be like a modern vintage person like I have vintage um styles but yeah I'm still I'm very modern still and I felt like the bobber was like that the Indian I mean I when I park in people come up to it they still are surprised that it's a 2018 they think it's like an older Indian that Mm -hmm. I just took really good care of (laughs) So did you, um, did you have an interest in pinup before the bike or, um, was it sort of sort something that kind of grew along with the bike? Um, interest in pinup you said, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I've always loved pinup. Uh, <laughs> um, I've always loved like the kind of rockabilly, um, pinup era, like what the women, I mean, for me, like the 1940s is when the women kind of you know, got out of the houses and they started working. Oh my gosh, my cat almost knocked this over. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, um, anyway, so yeah, like it was when, you know, it was during the war and women were like stepping up their working game and doing like all badass type of stuff. And by the same time, the models then were the models on like the, the you know, the bomber pinup, yeah, type yeah. models like I just I don't know there's something about like the 1940s that I was always drawn to and so I felt like I had like a past life in the 40s <laughs> <laughs> so your past Perfect. life wasn't that far along far back huh it really wasn't <laughs> no I I say that all the time I was like and in the 50s I'm like, oh, my goodness, oh, my cat is like adorable Say hi, Gwen. <laughs> hi. Oh. She's really clingy, so she's going to lay here for a second. I am absolutely stunned that my cats haven't come over here. Um, all day today during work, because this is my work desk as well, um, uh, all day they were climbing my lap. They were sitting right here on this desk. They were trying to get on my keyboard. Um, yeah. They climb my leg and make me scream because I'll be like fast at work, you know, like watching my screen. And then all of a sudden I just feel these like little kitten claws <laughs> coming up my leg. Um, uh, it's adorable. No, they are adorable. And it's it's horrible because uh, we've got, <laughs> we got too many animals already. So we've got four permanent cats that are in the house. We've got a dog. And then now we've got these two new kittens. We had four kittens. We adopted two of them out. And um, so we got two left. And I think they're going to end up staying, but we'll see. <laughs> so do you guys like um, foster cats or kittens or? Kind of. <sighs> kind of. So. No, I um, want to do that so badly. That's why I asked. My neighborhood has a lot of cats. And oh, okay. So there is a stray cat that has discovered our back patio is a great place to have kittens. Oh. So we've got two kittens from her previous litter already. That make yeah. up two of our four permanent cats are her last two kittens. And we didn't catch her to get her fixed. And um, she had disappeared from the yard. And the next time mm-hmm. we saw her, she my crazy. girlfriend came in and she goes, oh, my God. And I said, <laughs> I said, what? And she goes, I think I hear kittens out there. And I saw Mama Cat in the backyard. That's what we call <sighs> her. We, we call her Mama Cat. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, no. And she said, yeah. And I went outside. I didn't hear any kittens. I didn't see mama cats. So I was like, eh, whatever, maybe not, yeah. you know. And then maybe a few days later, I went outside because my dog is super old and, you know, I let him out and in. And I was standing outside with him, just kind of keep an eye on things. And I hear, meow, oh. meow. And I look over on my patio, underneath my patio chair, and there's a little orange face staring at me. Oh. And I was like, no. There are kittens. <laughs> anyway, so now we, we brought them in when they got old enough and we fostered yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're hoping to catch Mama Cat. We've got a trap in the car and I've got a can of uh, sardines that I plan on using to, to catch her. But yeah, we got, we got to get her fixed because I can't keep yeah. taking in more kittens, you know? Yeah. I'm too much of a softie. I have a hard time getting rid of them because I'm always like, oh, what if I give you them to someone who's like with them. that? And I would feel bad if I give them to someone. They treat them badly. You know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's just, uh, yeah, it's it's tough for me. Yeah. I'm, too, I'm too much of a softie for animals. 
All right. So let's see. What uh, what can we go next? Let's talk about some sort of sponsorship stuff. Do you have sponsors currently at all? Yeah, like I get sponsored from a lot of um, like clothing companies and um, a couple of like uh, moto brands. Um, my, I think like I feel like my exhaust is going to be my biggest one which I don't want to give away yet because I feel like I'm trying to keep it as a surprise uh, for what exhaust I get on the FTR. So um, yeah, so that one's this, been in the works for a while. So this podcast is probably going to come out in August. So if you plan on releasing it before so August. I don't know because like I said, it's been a long time that I've been waiting <laughs> for it. So um, it could be in a week like they said but then they said that like a month ago so i don't know I, okay well we'll, we'll keep yeah. it quiet for now are there yeah. no, no worries <laughs> um because i just know that when people get really curious i know i get really curious about like once people start getting recognized by brands not just the motorcycle brands but by the um like the clothing companies you know the the grip makers the mm -hmm. you know all the little bibs and bobs that that go around um like how long does it take before people start really contacting you like you feel like it's yeah. an account size do you feel like it's? i think it's like account size i think and maybe like how much work you put into your but so i'm one of those influencers moto influencers um that likes to modify her bike mm -hmm. so and i'm not saying that like the other ones don't um but i'm not one of those like i throw slip-ons on my exhaust and i'm good to go like i want to do like a whole like i've got all kinds of custom tune and exhaust and rear fender i just ordered and turn signals and headlight and bar and grips and everything so i do it all um and so like for me, I think companies maybe notice that and like, okay, this person really likes to do things for their bike. Um, so let's contact them. Also with that being said though, I tend to choose brands that aren't necessarily big and don't um, do sponsorships like that simply because I like that piece better. So I will pay for something over something for free, a sponsor because I like it better. So I'm not like one of those also, like it's like, I won't take whatever you give me. Like I've told people no, because I'm like, that's not really the look I'm going for. Mm -hmm. um, so no. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that makes perfect sense. You know, you don't want to have to be, you know, wearing stuff that you don't enjoy just because yeah. it's free, you know, it's one thing yeah. if someone pays you, I feel like, but if it's just like, Hey, here's some free free shirts and then you know exactly i think like a perfect example would be like my exhaust is not even for my bobber um i've gotten so many people it's notoriously loud my my exhaust um but they don't they don't even have an instagram you know what i mean so it wasn't like i was gonna get anything out of it i wasn't gonna get tags and shares and followers it was more of like this exhaust flows really nice with the bike and it sounds really good i want that one yeah yeah so everyone's mindset's different so that reminds me you live in california yes and you have an exhaust yes i have not gotten pulled over did you did you keep your stock exhaust just in case so that's tricky because i'm very rebellious <laughs> and um I did keep my stock exhaust, except that I chopped my um, exhaust and I removed the baffles from the stock exhaust. So oh, I know <laughs> <laughs> technically it's still stock, <laughs> but um, you know, yeah, there's that law, but they don't really care. At least in my opinion, they don't. I mean, I've had my exhaust on my bike for a year and a half and <laughs> Um, I've gone pulled over once for speeding and they didn't mention my exhaust. Okay. Well, so I just, I, um, I watched you. You've heard of Laidlaw? Um, no. The dealership. Well, I mean, you're, you're, you know, an Indian girl, but, uh, yeah. it, it's a Harley dealership. And this guy, oh, okay. uh, Laidlaw, I think his name's Michael Laidlaw. He's got his own YouTube channel and he just started his own podcast as well. Okay. And, uh, he does it with their, their, um, uh, their head mechanic, I forget what it's called, but basically it's him and his head mechanic. And they were just talking about how California has started fining um, people for even selling non-stock exhaust in California. So 
to some degree, it seems like they take it seriously, but then you were talking they about do, how... But if you know someone who lives out of state and they can purchase it for you and mm-hmm. then send it to you. Because, <laughs> yeah, there are companies that you can't buy you can't buy it from. Yeah, yeah. Like they were talking about how um, the Harley catalog, for instance, has all these different options, but they're not available in a lot of the state or not available in California, even if they are available in other states because mm-hmm. California is so strict um with that stuff like i guess um you know the dealership can be fined the i think he was saying even the person who's like behind the counter who sold it might be able to get fined uh don't quote me on that but that's Mm -hmm. how crazy it was about the whole stupid exhaust thing um yeah i believe it because i know that there's companies that you can't get your exhaust uh shipped here in california so But I also think there's ways around it, and I don't really understand that law, to be honest, just because I I have kind of two perspectives where I have one bike that's really loud, and then I have the FTR that still has exhaust or stock exhaust that sounds like a freaking sewing machine. And there's so many times where cars don't hear me, and so then they don't see me, and they're like literally trying to cut me off and that's frustrating um especially because that rarely happens with the bobber because it's so loud Mm -hmm. people know i'm coming people hear me um and so they kind of like look around because they're like where's that coming from um whereas the ftr even though i felt like i was gonna be more visible because i'm higher they don't they don't hear me (laughs) they don't hear me coming so they don't see me so that could be very dangerous 100 100 now There's a a lot of debate around whether, you know, the whole loud pipes saves lives thing. Some people call BS on it. Some people swear by it. Um, You know, I didn't even know it was a debate before I started riding motorcycles. uh, Because personally, when I was driving my truck, anytime I would hear a motorcycle, I would start looking around to see where that motorcycle was. Mm -hmm. So even though a lot of people say it's BS, I can only speak from personal experience as a driver before I rode motorcycles. And as a driver, when I heard a bike, I immediately started looking for where it was at. Where is that coming from? Where it was. Yeah. Um, It's like a siren. When you hear sirens, you're like, oh shit, where's it coming from? So I can stop. Yeah. Um, And I think that they prevent accidents. I really do. Well, and there's a lot of data that shows um, even when people look, they don't see motorcycles, you know, because of just the way the brain works. Uh, because the brain, when you learn to drive, especially if you've never ridden a motorcycle is looking for other cars. Mm -hmm. And so the brain just like fills in gaps. And so it's like, if you turn your head, you're looking right at a motorcycle, but because your brain's not expecting to see it, it just fills in like either empty space or whatever. And then you keep moving. Um, and so people legitimately just don't see you, even if they look right at you. Uh, Yeah. I don't know. I believe that. I think anything that helps you stand out. (laughs) I think so. There's this um, game that I I read about and that I try to um, do with my kids, which I think that if we can get other people to do it with their kids, um, and that's kind of like where you kind of almost like play I Spy. Yeah. But instead, you look for motorcycles. Like, let's see who can find the most motorcycles. And so it teaches those children to look out for motorcycles, where it's kind of that same thing where it's kind of embedded in your brain. Um, and you naturally like are always looking for motorcycles. Um, so like, I know like my son, my oldest does already like, and he'll like, be like, what kind of motorcycle is that? And he'll wait for it. And then he'll be like, Oh, that's a Harley or, or that's a whatever. Like he's, um, and so that kind of stuff, like I know growing up when he drives, like he's always going to notice motorcycles, you know, and he's going to be aware of the road and the riders. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. No. And actually that's one of the things I've heard people suggest um, for people who don't ride motorcycles is to do something like that because mm-hmm. it's the same principles principle behind when you are thinking about buying something like a certain kind of car, a certain kind of bike, all of a sudden you, you start see seeing it. it everywhere. Right. Yeah. 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 So, um, let's shift a little bit back to the sponsorship thing. If you could have one dream sponsor, you know, bike, clothing, whatever, it doesn't matter. Any, do you have a dream sponsorship in mind? Like a brand that I love? Yeah, a brand that you love (laughs) that if you just be sponsored by them. Two, I think. And that would be obviously Indian uh, motorcycle. And then I have one that's not. um, 
Indian related, but I'm obsessed with Coca Cola. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> so I like unlimited like lifetime supply of Coke. <laughs> That's hilarious. But it goes yeah. really well, I guess, with the pinup theme too, you know. It does. And it's crazy because it wasn't purposely like, you know, I just that's just naturally how I am. I love Coke. <laughs> I, I do too, but I have to get the uh I, I only like the Mexican Cokes with the real sugar. Um, yes, yeah. With the bot the bottle one. Yeah. So yeah. not only the flavor, but for some reason the other ones give me heartburn. That's interesting. So it's yeah, it's and um, the glass gets colder easier too. Like it it's does. it's really yeah, I, I I buy the little four pack of those, and like when I want to like spoil myself, I'll have like one of those. I can't finish it. I don't even drink that much soda, but I still love Coke. <laughs> yeah, I um I don't drink that much soda either. For a while, I was you know, for the first probably couple months of social isolation, social isolation, yeah. I was kind of going hog wild with the sodas, <laughs> and I was getting like you know six of those things a week. Yeah, um, which for me is a lot. Um, but I've, I've since basically cut it out cause it was like, Oh, you know, I'm fat enough. I don't need to drink all this soda. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's cool. Coke and Indian. Mm -hmm. hmm. That'd be an interesting photo shoot, you know, make yeah. like a, like a Coca-Cola advertisement, mm -hmm. um, on an Indian motorcycle. You can have one of the red bandanas or something. Yeah. Yeah. I would love <laughs> to do that. <laughs> so now that kind of leads us to the other aspect of what I see a lot of on your Instagram account, which seems to be modeling. Um, how long have you been modeling? You know, that's so crazy hearing that because I am not like a model, I guess. Okay. I guess I would kind of, I guess, categorize myself as a model now, but like, I always joke that like buying a motorcycle and then like building an Instagram off of it turned me into a model because I never intentionally tried to do that. It just kind of was more of like, here's pictures of my bikes or my bike. And then like, you know, modifications and here's a picture with me on it. And then I wanted to always do like that pinup look. And so I did it, but really kind of triggered it was I kind of slowly started getting um, DMs from photographers wanting to take my picture with a bike. Mm -hmm. um, I still remember the first one and I was like, this is so weird. Um, and so I did it. And then right after that, they just started flowing in like crazy. And so mm -hmm. I've lost count of how many photographers I've collabed with. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of, and this was like before I had like over the 10 K mark on Instagram. I think I only had maybe like 3000 followers. Um, so yeah, that's pretty, it's crazy, but that's, I guess what it is. <laughs> Okay. So then I take it. Um, well, I guess you didn't mention how long ago you bought the uh, bobber. Um, so I got it in early 2018. Okay. So two so years. About two years. So you've been modeling approximately two years, year and a half. So I would say then. Like a like. year and a half. I would say like halfway in is when. Okay. They started asking. <laughs> so now that you've kind of gotten more involved in the uh, modeling and photography scene, um, do you have any kind of dream shoots in mind that you really want to do? Uh, I think you mentioned about Frida Kahlo at one point. Yeah. So I would love to do um, anything like cultural related um, just because it's, I mean, it's my culture and I feel like a lot of pride. Um, but I also feel really confident in that kind of setting. Um, maybe because I'm really comfortable. I'm not too sure. Um, another one that I really, really, really want to do once I like get brave enough is I really would love to like recreate like a Betty Page kind of photo shoot. Um, I've loved that woman since like high school and um, her photos and just like her style. Mm -hmm. I would love to do something like that if I... <laughs> get brave enough to do it <laughs> well you know um first off a model is anyone who's willing to get in front of a camera you know mm -hmm. number one and i think personally this is kind of infringing on a question i've got later down in here but um you know so like i mentioned i mentioned before that i'm a photographer but i i don't um i don't think i mentioned that my primary business was actually boudoir photography um before this whole oh, thing okay hit so um, you know, you run across a lot of people who have these ideas like, ah, 
you know, this type of photography or this type of modeling or this type of um, gift for my husband, spouse, whoever, you know, isn't for me. And it's like, well, you know, no, number one, everyone should have the confidence that they are beautiful. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And if you constantly just compare yourself to what's put in magazines, well, that's, you know, that's ludicrous. It's just gonna make people feel bad. You yeah. know, I think it's done a lot of damage to people's psyches, like putting forward this idea that like, this is what's beautiful. But as you see, because you're into pinup, like what is quote unquote beautiful changes throughout time. You know, yeah. it's really subjective and it's um, it really is. one of these things that if you're trying to keep up with what's, what's beautiful, you'll never fit in because like, you know, growing up in the eighties, it was always like the super skinny, super twig like models. Right. And then now the 90s. it's like big, bo- yeah. big booties, you know what I mean? Like tiny the waves. 90s with big boobs. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like the Pamela <laughs> Anderson change. type deal. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think that if people are trying to like, you know, wait until they fit the modern, whatever the modern beauty standard is to do something. Well, you may never, you know, reach that because it's just manufactured by media because you always have to have something new and something that people can't actually do. Otherwise, you know, what, what, how do they stand out? Like if those women look like everyone, then of course they're not going to, um, yeah, they won't sell as many magazines. Like you can't sell someone on how to build bigger, how to build a bigger booty if everyone's yeah. got a bigger booty. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> no, so, it makes sense. I get it. Yeah. Sorry. I went off on a tangent, but uh, anyway, I think if you want to do it, you should do it. And, yeah. uh, you know, and if you don't though, cause it's one of those areas personally where I think people really need to be careful about pushing boundaries because in life, pushing boundaries can be a healthy thing, but it can also, you know, be an unhealthy thing. And, and it's, one of those things you really got to think through as far as, you know, is this a healthy boundary I'm pushing or is this mm-hmm. a boundary that I'm not really that comfortable pushing? If that makes sense. So. No, it. I get it. Anyway. I think I will do it. I just get n- or nervous. Well, okay. Yeah. How long do you think you'll continue modeling? Have you thought about it at all? Or? For as long as people still want to shoot me. <laughs> because it's it's I think the thing I like about it the most is having the images to pass on to like my children possibly like my future grandchildren um especially like the females of you know of my daughter and if you know my sons or her decide to have children if they have daughters like it's kind of one of those like well if mom and grandma can ride motorcycles then it kind of more of like that empowering feeling um, is what I'm trying to hand down. Mm-hmm. Do you have any other hobbies besides modeling and motorcycles? And now I know dance, so this is probably a redundant question. Dancing, running. Running, okay. Um, and uh, makeup. Um, I've done a lot of, like, character makeup. Like, I've turned myself into, like, Venom and, like... Um, like Michael Jackson, like that kind of stuff. I think I always, I think that would be really cool to do some kind of like um, special effects kind of makeup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have like a huge interest in that. So what <laughs> what uh, do your parents think of you riding a motorcycle? Um, so my mom, I think at first was kind of like, like nervous, um, just like any mother would be. Mine was. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, but now I think she embraces it. I think that she is very, uh, um, I mean, she was a single mom. And so she's kind of like had that like strength in her that I think that she kind of, um, directed towards me and my sister. Um, neither of us are completely girly girly. Um, I guess you can say, I like my sister joined the, um, the army and the national guard like right out of high school which isn't like typical of like a woman and then then there's me who's um always done the harder like boxing riding motorcycles male dominant type of stuff so Mm -hmm. um I kind of almost like I mean it's kind of like her fault that I do it (laughs) because so that's cool 
How long, yeah. uh, how long have you boxed? So I boxed for like four years and then I stopped just because of like scheduling wise, but I miss it so much. Yeah. So that, that's what happened with me too. Once I got, um, got, you know, a promotion and some additional responsibilities and stuff, it mm-hmm. just became impossible to make the classes. Cause I, I did MMA for a while. So I did Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu and Judo and yeah. know, that kind of stuff, but it was like, you know, the times all the classes have a set schedule and then I never knew when I was going to leave the office. And then I was paying all this money for something that I can only go to like once a month. So yeah. I ended up dropping it, but I'm, I'm right there with you. I miss it a lot. Um, did you ever do any competitions? Did you ever box? No, not like any kind of actual, I just like sparring, but not, um, not any fights. I think there was a point where I was ready, but then it was kind of hard to find someone in like my weight class and my, um, experience level and so that was only for like I think it was like a fight that was coming up he was gonna look for someone and then after that it just kind of was like you know it was just kind of more of like a like a workout stress reliever type thing so oh yeah I mean you so we used to always say you know there's no workout like a fight workout you know no there's <laughs> not you use so much energy to be surprised you like train you think you're cool and then you spar and then you're just like what the hell that was like so draining like someone who run i run endurance and i would be yeah. like tired from like three rounds so yeah there's um i wish i could remember who who said this and who, who the origin of the quote is but they're like everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so i i definitely understand that so <laughs> would you consider yourself a feminist yes no if yes why if not why not um, I guess so. I would say, yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess just because, um, I think that, I don't know, I go back and forth on this because it depends on like how you define feminism. But for me, I think that we, as women should have equal opportunities. Um, but at the same time, I am very aware of how different men and women are, um, and the way that we are just built um, physically. And, um, I think that's the only thing where it comes to play where like, yeah, I I just can't explain it. Whereas like, okay, I guess the best way to explain it is I have twins and they're, I have a son and a daughter. And I know for a fact that when my son is out late, I won't be as worried as I would be for my daughter who's out late. So, um, there's that, like, without even really fully being aware of how bias that people are and so like I know I will be like I can't I can tell you yes I think that women need equal rights and opportunities and that there shouldn't be different rules put on them but at the same time like uh, I know that I fully don't you know act on that what uh do you have a favorite book and what is it if you do um my favorite book is definitely the hobbit oh nice Um, yeah, I'm a huge Lord of the Rings geek. Um, nope, stop. So, yeah, that book is definitely, I. my teacher, I think it was fourth grade teacher, read it to us. And um, so, like, ever since then, it was just, it was one of those things where I was excited to go to class because I'm like, uh, her name was Miss Bishop. So she's she's going to finish the, this chapter today. Like, I want to know what's going to happen. And so it was kind of one of those, like, first books that drew my attention or, like, kept my attention even like I don't think I really enjoyed reading that much before that so um so yeah it's definitely it's the hobbit okay so um did you go on to read the rest of the the books that I take it yeah did you have a favorite outside of the hobbit or um I really like the hobbit and yeah I, I love the hobbit I think sometimes there's some nostalgia to the first book that you really enjoy um too it holds a special place in your heart i think i think you're right and i think maybe that's possibly it isn't necessarily because i enjoyed the book more but more of like it was like that first book that i fell in love with so yeah no so um for me when i was like i don't know 10 11 12 somewhere in that age age range right my uh my aunt gave me a book to read um called watchers by dean coons Mm-hmm. And um, it was the first real novel I ever read and just really, really enjoyed. And I, I think I've probably read books now that are better 
um, since then, but I still consider it my favorite book just because yeah. it was the first one that I really loved. The first time I got yes. absorbed in a book, you know? Yeah. Nope. Totally get it. It makes <laughs> sense. Um, so do you have any books that you're reading right now or? I don't have any books that I'm reading right now. You know, it's funny. I have a book that my sister gifted me. Um, and she, I want to say it was like months ago and I haven't picked it up yet, but it's right there by my bed. And it's funny cause it's actually, um, based it's not a lord of the rings book but this person um translated the book um and uh, J.R.R. token who's the author mm-hmm. was a um very devoted catholic and so like the meaning behind the lord of the rings um is basically what this book is based i'm catholic my family's catholic and so she gifted me that book and i've been dying to read it like so badly um and i just haven't been able to pick it up <laughs> I should do that tonight. <laughs> I keep telling myself like all the time. I'm like, I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to start it. And I just have it. I go through phases. I feel like where, you know, I get really into books. And so I'll, mm-hmm. I'll read like a bunch in a row and then I get distracted by something else I'm doing and realize, Oh, it's been a while since I've read a book. And then I'll go back and <laughs> I'll, I'll read some more. I think, yeah. um, I think the last one, I can't remember the last one I read. Oh, you know what? I'm actually still reading it is, um, it's called Sweat the Technique by Rakim. Okay, no, I don't. I mean, I'm not like big on books. No, no, no. This actually, Rakim's a rapper, right? <laughs> so <laughs> he uh, he wrote a book called Sweat the Technique, and um, I uh, yeah, I've, that title makes more sense. <laughs> yeah, so I, I really I like his music. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that I'm like a super fan or anything, but I really like his music. And he happened to be doing a book uh, signing not too long before the whole shutdown stuff happened. And oh, okay. so I went ahead and bought the book and got it signed. And I've been kind of like reading it here and there um, ever since. It's not that long of a book, but, um, you know, it's actually what I was doing was I, I used to smoke a lot of cigars. And so I would go on my back patio and smoke a cigar and read some of the book, but I haven't been smoking for a long time. Um, and so I just haven't, uh, it's probably still sitting on my back patio, like right next to the table, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Have you ever traveled? Do you enjoy traveling? Yeah, I enjoy traveling. Okay. So like, I know that's even kind of. Well, not everyone does. I mean, I know yeah. people who hate traveling. Yeah. Um, and think I mean, I'm a traveler. I love to travel. I mean, if you can't tell by the fact that I just talking about being in Nicaragua back in November. Yeah. Um, I like to travel, but I've definitely met people who are just like, I hate planes. Um, I hate going and like staying in hotels. I like my own bed. You know what I mean? Like, so not everyone likes it. I feel like I'm maybe like in the middle then, because I like being home. Um and I don't, I don't adapt to change very easily. So, um, yeah. And then like, I don't necessarily feel like the need to travel, I guess. I don't know. Like there's one place I really would love to go to and that's New Zealand. Um, but other than that, <laughs> I'm not, the you know, exactly. Surprise, surprise. Um, and okay. uh, other than that, I don't really, I don't really have a like need or want to travel. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I understand the New Zealand thing that uh, number one, of course, you've got the Lord of the Rings set is out there, right? I think they got the hot yeah. holes and all that kind of yes. stuff. Uh, but it's also a beautiful Middle country. Earth. Beautiful, it is. beautiful country. So I totally, I totally get that. Um, I was in Iceland and it's also a beautiful country. Kind of reminded me of uh, some of the scenes from Lord of the Rings when they're in the, the icy mountains, you know? Yeah. Uh, Iceland does kind of look like a Middle Earth. <laughs> well, only uh, some parts of it. I think New Zealand, obviously, yeah. since they filmed it there, <laughs> uh, has more. That's definitely uh, it. <laughs> it definitely looks more like it. Uh, but yeah, when we were going through some of the um, some of the areas there, it kind of made me think back to some of the Lord of the Rings movies when they're like in those little mountain passes and it's all snowy and yeah. And, if your kids decide to ride motorcycles, would you be supportive or would you be the mom who is like, ah, that's not that safe? <laughs> um, That's funny because like I really don't want to put the kids on like a passenger like with me. I don't even feel comfortable doing that. So I don't know. But I know like my son is going to want to ride 
my daughter can care less about bikes, but if she grew up and changed her mind, then I think I would be supportive. I think I would just do my best to make sure that they're mature enough, number one. Um, And then number two is just kind of give them as much knowledge and um, writing tips and that I can do, but I'm not going to stop them from doing it. Because I think that's kind of where my parents fell. Was like, my mom was just like, you know, you're never going to ride a motorcycle as long as you're in my house. And uh, it was funny because I never had an interest in it. Um, so her saying that really didn't mean anything to me because I was like, ah, whatever, I don't, I don't care, you know, yeah. until I got on one and then I was hooked. And ever since then, I've been thinking about motorcycles and, yeah. uh, you know, now I just love it. I mean, it's one of the few things I can do now where I don't have to worry about interacting with a bunch of people, you know, I can just hop on my bike and go for a ride. I mean, I even really enjoy my parking lot practice stuff, you know, like getting out and yeah. just like trying to do stuff that's hard on the bike and practicing over and over and then like watching myself get better. Um, my cat. <laughs> I, I, I told you she's cats. really, no, she's no. clingy. She's like, wants my attention. She's like, what are you doing, dude? Well, she's, she's cute. I'm surprised you're able to yeah. tell her no. I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, all right. So let's do a couple more and then I'll let you, let you get out of here and interact with the kids. Um, <laughs> Let's let's go with uh, let's go with one of these happy things. What would you consider to be your happiest childhood memory? I think just kind of like playing with my friends and my cousin, um, like playing like tag, because like I mentioned earlier, I, there's a huge gap between me and my siblings, so I almost kind of felt like an only child. And so my cousin, who was only three years older than me, and then my neighbors. Um, there was my best friend who I'm still best friends with today. So I've known her since I was like five. Um, she was a year older than me and then she had a brother that was my age. And so there was like a group of friends and this was before electronics or any of that. So we would just play, play tag, play freeze tag, play football, play all kinds of stuff. I was a huge tomboy when I was younger. So sports and that kind of stuff that would have to be definitely my happiest childhood memories is just playing (laughs) i just feel so fortunate that i lived and grew up in the 90s so yeah yeah. i have to right like there's not a lot of like there wasn't like social media there wasn't you know playstations i mean i guess there were but you know there were yeah it was just better so what do you consider your happiest adult memory I guess probably like my wedding day, just because like my children were present. It was one of those where, you know, my kids were kind of like in the wedding. Yeah. Um, So that was cool. That was something like my my kids kind of remember it, you know, Um, they were really young, but it would have to be that. So did you guys go big with your wedding or did you go something a little bit smaller? What was it was your... uh, it was like medium. I actually didn't want a big wedding. I just wanted to like get married, but my family and like our family wanted a wedding. So we had like like 150 guests, I think. So I don't know if you consider that big. Is that big? <laughs> I, I think I had 12 in mind. <laughs> okay, then so then we had like a bigger <laughs> wedding. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, I wondered because, you know, it's one of those things where um, even though it's your wedding, there are a remarkable number of people involved who want to have some sort of input on it, you know? Oh, yeah. And then, too, I think part of our culture, too, because we're Mexican, is like family is just big. And so it was kind of like if you invite one cousin, you have to invite all of your cousins. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, it was just kind of, I think, like, people would be offended if they didn't get an invitation that's just kind of how it is and family so, drama <laughs> yeah so everyone so everyone comes <laughs> it's a big so party is your husband mexican too then yes yeah and his parents are like his mom is one of um i believe eight or nine kids yeah yeah i mean so you know my girlfriend's mexican and i went to um one of her friend's weddings as well and I was just like, I mean, again, because I only had like, you know, when I got married, I only had like 12 people in my wedding and I never really considered having more. And so, yeah. and I've always really disliked weddings. I mean, I went to one when I was a kid and I've just not been a wedding person. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I've been avoiding them for all this time. And <laughs> 
to suddenly go and uh, be submersed into this wedding where there was just like so many people around. I didn't know how people kept track, you know. Um, anyway, for me, it was it was just um, overwhelming. And I think that it would have been a lot of logistics, you know, to make sure everyone's fed and make sure everyone's happy. Yeah. And like, you know, but then, you know, you're talking to people and you do find out it's one of those things where it's like, well, okay, if you don't invite this person, then they're going to be mad. But if you, if you do invite this other person, but you don't invite their whatever, then mm-hmm. it's going to seem like a slight too. And it's like, are all these people paying for this wedding? Because that's a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. It can get expensive. Did you guys try to fund it yourselves or did you guys get some help from family or? We got help. Yeah. We, I mean, we paid for what we could and then we got help. So that's nice. It was like it's... I said, they really they wanted it more than we both did. We just kind of like we're like, we just want to get married. We don't want to put the money into that, basically. We wanted to put the money into something else. So um our family were more more than willing to help since they were the ones that were like, Well, we want this wedding. So <laughs> No, that that's perfect. I uh, yeah. I completely sympathize. I you know, again. I do accounting as my, my day job. And so like you, you start thinking about all the money you're spending on flowers, photographers, um, clothes, food, the venue, you know, I mean, even the priest or whoever decides to marry you wants some money. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and it's it gets just, expensive. It gets really expensive, you know? All right. Well, I thank you for coming on this podcast with me. Um, I really do appreciate it. And yeah. uh, I love your content on Instagram. I'm excited to see what else keeps coming out of your YouTube because I, I see you've got that YouTube channel um, started. And um, yeah, you said you might have an exhaust coming as early as next week. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. <laughs> All right. I'm going to say goodbye before I keep talking. <laughs> have a good one. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. If you'd like to follow along with The Modern Squid and get more information on upcoming guests and anything else that's going to be happening, you can either follow me on The Modern Squid Instagram or also you can find me under the Desert Mofo channel at uh, Desert Space M-O-P-H-O on YouTube. And there'll be a channel for The Modern Squid. I also have a website, themodernsquid.com, that will also have this information. So... You can follow along through your medium of choice. Thanks again.